Our panel will explore the future of GIS data curation in libraries, and speakers will address the traditional ways libraries have incorporated GIS services and um, how researchers are using GIS. My name is Chris Freeland. I um, am a associate university librarian at Washington University. Uh, this is my third week um, in the job. Before, uh, previously I was at the Missouri Botanical Garden for 800 years, about 15 actually, and uh, I was the director of the Center for Biodiversity and Informatics, and I uh, was responsible for some of our geospatial analysis uh, work and the um, some of our mu museum management systems. So I come, uh, I describe myself as a recovering biologist who has landed in library land um, because I was very, in, my background is in biology, I was always interested in technology and it was GIS that was, uh, when, I, when I did a GIS course in college, it was sort of the aha moment. I, I knew I wasn't interested in field work, so I didn't know what I was gonna do with biology and when I saw GIS, I was like, hey, technology, that's the, that's the right approach. So I'm going to talk about digital asset management systems and hopefully try to, to draw some lines through um, some of these challenges, the, you know, the data challenges and the data curation problems um, and how some of these systems do and do not address uh, the challenges. So a digital asset management system, or DAMS, um, it's a combination of hardware and software that, that's used to store digital assets. So things like Word files or you know, documents or media files, audio files, and including data sets. Uh, these these systems really came to be uh, came to the forefront in the in the late 90s, early 2000s, when uh, libraries were being funded, getting funding to do digitization projects. So there were lots of media assets, new media assets that hadn't been managed before, um, and so these these digital asset management systems kind of came on the on the scene in a long, a, a very strong way, and the libraries started integrating them into their system architecture. So. From a very high level, a, uh, a digital asset management system simplifies some of these issues of where is it and what is it named and what is its metadata that doesn't have to be bundled with the file itself. So uh, imagine, oh, I have a pointer. imagine uh, someone taking a picture with a cell phone and dropping it into some kind of a system. And these DAMs provide user interfaces and or uh, APIs, application programming interfaces for machine to machine communication that allow you to, to add an image. And then it separates this, the, the DAMS keeps track of the metadata about that object and its location, and those are two separate things. So that you don't have to worry about what, what's it named and what information is contained within the file. And if you, move a, if you move something from drive A to drive B, this is what the system does. It, it keeps track of all of these objects and the, and the information about the objects. And then hopefully they are also Systems are also open enough that you can provide API access so that you can build applications on top of them, so that you can extract out your geospatial imagery or your data sets and, uh, and, and build a custom application. And I'm going to show an example of that uh, that we did at the Botanical Garden. Lots of different ways of, of talking about a digital asset management system, ways of clumping or grouping them. Uh, you can look at proprietary versus open source, different ways. I, I went, uh, kind of followed this, the same theme actually of going from a personal archive to an institutional or you know, shared repository to enterprise solutions. And, and um, this doesn't even include, well, if you think about like an enterprise solution, I, when I think of an enterprise solution, I'm thinking of something that, that's media rich, some, some place like a publishing company, Condé Nast, you know, who, that publishing uh, magazines, uh, websites, Lots of media, multiple places, they have to have some management system that can bring all those things together, that can manage all their digital assets. Those, you can also think of these as the, the numbers of zeros after the dollar sign, right? So these are tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars of solutions. Institutional repositories, I'm gonna talk more about Fedora Commons, another uh, frequently used institutional repository is DSpace. And then I, I think that, that these, uh, these Research repositories are the, the wave of the future. I think this is uh, what we're going to see more of these. And these are more in the free to tens of thousands of dollars to implement, uh, hopefully not in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then like personal asset management, Dropbox is a good one. Flickr is another example. Evernote is something that I use for um, taking screenshots and uh, making notes. And you know these things are usually free to $10 or so, so zeros. Uh, uh, up the board. 
Now, connecting GIS and digital asset management systems, uh, as I was preparing this, I went and did some searches, and I stumbled across this uh, outdated forum that made me laugh a little bit and cry a little bit as well. Because if you can see it, and you may not, this was uh, asked in 2003. Uh, the, the requests were saying, we have a large custom map archive, it's in Conto Cumulus, but I want to be able to connect that with ArcGIS. That question was asked in 2003. There were no replies. The forum was closed. Uh, in, the, in the new forum, this question has not been asked. So I think the answer is there is not a little to no native support for making these connections between systems, and it requires custom programming. And that was the uh, initiative, the, the task that I had ahead of me when, uh, when we were integrating a GIS system, our server, our, our GIS server, into a project uh, at the Botanical Garden. So I'm going to try to bring this all together as a case, uh, an example of a system that integrates both a, a GIS system and a geospatial data and a, a digital asset management system. The trop uh, Tropicos is the Missouri Botanical Garden's botanical information system. And it contains information about this act here, which is a biologist goes out in the field, collects a plant, and then it comes into uh, some museum storage, or in this case, a herbarium type collection of plants. So that whole life cycle of what happens from the point when it's extracted out of the ground, who did that, where were they, um, what does it look like, what were some of the elevation, all of that information follows, is usually written down on paper and then follows it into the, uh, being databased and uh, follows the object into the museum. We also map using Esri tools and other technologies like uh, Google Maps. We had ArcIMS running, up, uh, started in about 2000, and it was only recently taken offline just a couple of years ago. So it, it ran for a good long time, producing very basic dot maps. Um, we integrated ArcGIS server. At, at that time, it was 9.3, which was about 2009, 2010, when we were working on that. And um, uh, recently, about six months ago, upgraded to, uh, to server 10. And then the digital asset management system that we used was Fedora Commons. So I have some screenshots. This is a, a look at tropicos.org, which, which gives you facilities to do searches on different kinds of information, whether you want to search on the collectors or on the specimens, with, you know, a location-based search. And I'm going to do a name-based search. So I, uh, in the dialog box, I've pre-typed uh, a scientific name. It's Heuchera sanguinea. Heuchera sanguinea is coral bells, which you may Probably all of you have in your shade gardens or your neighbor's shade garden. It's very common. It's a leafy plant with a red crimson flower um, up on a stalk. Very pretty. Used to be a native plant. Made us move into uh, lots of cultivation, uh, lots of uh, hybridization. But it did start off as, an, as a native plant in the, in the 1850s or first collected. So I, I did a search for that name, and this is showing then all of the information that Tropicos has. This is all, think of these things as, you know, th this is metadata, museum metadata about the object and about that collection event, including digital images. One, so I'm going to click then on the specimens tab. Uh, difference between a specimen and a name. When you collect a plant, it doesn't tell you what its uh, identification is. It, it's just a plant. So specimens are just the objects that are collected. Names are applied to those specimens afterwards. So it's not as though when, uh, when uh, Pringle made his collection in 1888, it's not as though the plant announced itself as Heuchera sanguinea. Someone came in a, after the fact and said, this specimen is this plant name. So a connection there. I'm looking at all of the, the specimens for, uh, for this name. And I can look at all regions, all countries, and click on and make my selection of the different kinds of uh, mapping interface that I'd like to use. And I'll click on the on the Esri map, which brings up then this display. So this has these are the locations at which plants were collected. The color coding is by the different names. So you, this this view is looking at three different collectors um, over all time. Uh, this is not a, a, a time based uh, view. This is uh, the aggregate of this is the, the composite of everything. And so we're displaying at this location, then this plant was collected by Friedrich Wislezinus, who was a, a Polish botanist, um, and it was collected in 1846, and a, a, a link to the image. So I can click on the, on the little thumbnail to get metadata about the image. I can click on view full screen, 
Um, and then I can use this sort of Google Maps-like interface to zoom in and see greater detail of this little piece right there. Um, so how does this all work? How does it all come together? System architecture time. The, 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 I won't say the interesting part, but it all comes together. You, I, can, I was able to grab the slice of where GIS and, and a digital asset management system and custom programming were all coming together in about 600 pixels, so that was, that was cool. Um, if you look at this broken off into the, the GIS side of the world, Tropicos is built, it, it, its data store is SQL Server. I get a little too happy with the, <laughs> with the later pointer. Um, and, and we used our GIS server to, to provide the base maps and to, and to put the points on the map using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript. So you can see that there is a sort of a GIS path up through the display layer. Oh, I'm sorry, I should mention, so we have, I've, I've broken this out into different tiers, so file system, data storage, application layer, and pres uh, presentation layer, or UI, or, or uh, user interface, or, or API. So that's the way that the map is produced, and the points on the map. The thumbnail is drawn, and the, and the link into the larger image is drawn from the, the digital asset management side. So the file, the image is stored on the file system, the metadata comes from the data store, which happens in this case to be MySQL. The application, Fedora Commons, knows the metadata, it knows the file uh, system, and it can respond to this request and say, you need this little thumbnail for this image that's stored and managed over here in the, in the GIS side. And what brings it all together then is custom programming that happens up at that pres uh, presentation layer that so when, when I, as a user, when I clicked on that map that said, let me see this, let me, uh, let me see this map and all the data points, it was the pres presentation layer and the application layer, a handoff between those two. It was saying, oh, you want to look at this side, this part of the map, which means I need to draw those dots and bring up these images. So a lot of custom programming that happened here in this UI to application side. And the, we let the, the GIS server do its thing, and we let Fedora do what it does best, which is manage this thing, this digital object is in this place, and it has these attributes. So takeaway or the conclusions of, is that libraries have invested in, in these digital asset management systems for media storage and delivery. So it's part of the library way of working that we have these kinds of systems in our, uh, in our bag of tricks. The, there are opportunities for use with these custom apps, but it requires customization and trade-offs and maybe uh, a, a negotiation of what features we can and cannot produce. It does work. It is not simple. And I think that because of some of these limitations with individual repositories, I think that this, the move towards community-supported research data portals is probably going to win out in the, in the long term, uh, in, in the long run, because there's more... Uh, it just makes sense to be able to, to think about sharing your data with others and, and to try to avoid some of these individual Dropbox file system-based prob problems. So I think that the, what I would hope that we could do from this, um, as, the, as these uh, repositories uh, uh, start getting more widely uh, adopted, we want to make sure that those have some of these features and APIs on top of them that the digital asset management systems do so that we can ask these repositories to be providing some of that asset management um, work that uh, that we don't want to have happen that we're struggling with down at the library layer. Okay, and I think now we move to discussion and questions. Yes. <laughs>